Welcome to Champagne Problems Podcast. I am your host, Robbie Shaw. Join us as we explore mental and emotional well-being, physical optimization, and the journey to discovering your highest self. Champagne Problems is brought to you in proud partnership with Bond Buzz, the alcohol-free social spirit. Bond Buzz is an award-winning, alcohol-free functional beverage company creating adult drinks that are health-forward, all-natural, and uncompromising. They're on a mission to create a future where feeling good and getting buzzed exist in absolute harmony and not at the expense of your health. Their bold concoctions offer focus and energy while calming the nervous system for a night on the town or a productive afternoon. Bond Buzz uses only natural ingredients and a hyperfunctional blend of nootropics, adaptogens, and functional mushrooms to amplify the sensory experience. If you're looking for a drink to help you cool off after work or a drink to stimulate your mind and body without the harmful, icky hangovers, drink Bond Buzz for good days only. Welcome back, everybody. Today we have my good friend, former NBA star and Duke basketball legend Mike Jeminski on the show. Mike was the ACC Player of the Year in 1979 and played 14 seasons in the NBA before ending his career with the Charlotte Hornets in the early 90s. Today we're going to talk a little bit about basketball, but more importantly, we're going to get into Mike's journey around alcohol. I've been waiting to record this episode for a while, so let's go to Mike. Mike Jeminski, <laughs> welcome to Champagne Problems. Thank you, Patrick. It's uh, it's taken us a while to get this together, but yeah. um, I'm glad I'm finally we're, here we're and finally uh, here. spend some time with you. Yeah, man, I've been excited about this for uh, for a while, and um, now I'm, I'm glad Robbie had something come up today. So I'm glad that we uh, we were able to do this, just the two of us. I think uh, this will be a, a good conversation, man. I've known you for a long time, um, not as well, obviously, as I know you now. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I I remember watching you play when I was a kid with the Hornets, and um, and then you know I remember. I think the first time I met you in person um, was at my friend Chris Gunderman's birthday party. Kathleen Hesser, his mother, um, <laughs> yeah. had you come and play basketball with us at, at his birthday, and that was the first time we met. And then, you know, my uh, my my family um, has known you over the years, and I, you know, would run into you at Arthur's every now and then. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm just I'm really excited that we've reconnected over the last. Uh, year or so and um uh, and how we've connected and and i think that you know you're you're the perfect uh candidate for for our show in terms of your story and and um and i've really been excited about mm -hmm. having you on so um let's let it rip man let's uh you know i just kind of want to let this flow and okay. um you know as you know i'm a big basketball junkie and mm -hmm. um you know, so I'd love to hear a little bit of, of your backstory. I did an intro, uh, um, you know, and I think most people know who you are and, and your basketball history, but, but let's kind of go over that real quick in, in terms of like what your, what your kind of childhood looked like. And then, you know, when basketball kind of took off and then we'll just go from there. I guess looking back on a little, a little conflicted and it wasn't uh it wasn't the norm i don't know that anybody's childhood is the norm though um i had a a father who had aspirations of being an athlete himself and fell short of those aspirations for whatever reason and uh, when i came along it was his mission to turn me into a professional athlete and uh, kind of live vicariously through me um which you know you're grown up and that's all you know and that's so that's all you know and yeah. um you know it, it was funny he wanted me to be a baseball player um and genetics kept on driving me um, I, I played all sports when i was when i was growing up the first real epiphany that i had and then looking back on it now i can call it that was when i was 11 years old i i had taken part in i don't remember the punt pass and kick competitions yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and uh and and you know started in my my dad started me on those when i was eight years old that was the first year that you were eligible and um when i was 11 i won the national championship i didn't know that yeah <laughs> and that was my first real taste of success on a big level and, you know, getting some media attention, even though, you know, it was in Connecticut, but still I was, you know, we're on national TV at the halftime of the Pro Bowl um, out in Los Angeles. And uh, 
you know, getting traveling back and forth. The, the, the semifinals were in San Diego, actually. So we got two first class tickets back and forth to the West Coast. You know, as an 11 year old, this is some, you know, pretty heady stuff. But that, that really showed me the level of where I could go. Yeah. Um, and it also gave me a taste of, of national success. Mm hmm. And then, um, you know, I was in middle school, little league. You know, that I was really, really good at baseball. I mean, I, and I loved baseball. But uh, genetics took uh, over, and you know, my dad was six eight, so um, you know, I kept I kept growing. And by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was six seven, and was starting to get recruited by. By basketball, I didn't play really until eighth grade was my first year organized ball. And like we played pickup, you know, yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. the guys around the neighborhood. But uh, I had some allergy and some asthma issues, so eighth grade was my first full year of competition. Yeah. And then a year later, I'm six seven. Um, I'm starting on the varsity early on in the season, and. The University of Maryland comes walking in the door after my freshman season. And I'm starting to get recruited, and all of a sudden, uh, this path. You know, I was six nine as a sophomore. Um, my baseball skills started to deteriorate, and then I said, "All right, this is um, my path is kind of being chosen for me yeah. here," which was cool. I mean, I love ball. You know, I love playing basketball, and um, but that's that's kind of how my athletics evolved through my childhood that's super cool i didn't know about the pump pass kick thing i wonder if you're like a if you were like a nfl kicker in a different well, yeah <laughs> different well, dimension well i was different. in uh I'm, i actually i'm i'm proud i'm i do have a little small plaque in the uh in the football hall of fame and can't know where they guess they crazy. honor all that so that's awesome you know but it was uh it was funny. My freshman year, I did the kicking and the punting on the varsity football team, wow. and I remember, um, I remember kicking off. It was later in the season and running down on coverage, and I just got decleated by some guy. <laughs> And I yeah, remember, yeah, I remember laying yeah. there on the ground saying, "I think I'm going to be a basketball player." Nice. <laughs> so you're six nine, sophomore year start getting recruited mm -hmm. were there any uh because you know i want to pepper in some of the alcohol stuff yeah. like did you drink at all in high school oh, yeah. or was that yeah yeah, yeah. um so it, was, it, it was a thing it was around my family yeah. um my grandfather and his brothers had a, they were all woodworkers and they they had a cabinet shop and so i used to go down there and hang out when i was growing up and my my uncle ray used to try to give me a shot of whiskey and you know it's yeah. a, you know Polish thing, right of passage. Yeah, and uh, but then you know, I nothing, nothing really. I, I got to uh, probably it was in summer or after my freshman year, maybe, um, and it going in my sophomore year because I was around the varsity. I was starting, yeah, yeah, and I was hanging out with those guys, yeah. and we had some older guys. We had guys who were eighteen, nineteen years old as seniors then. Yeah, you could buy booze back then at eighteen. Right? Yeah, well, we we had uh, the the package stores in in Connecticut closed at eight o'clock, and we had a we had a park that we used to play in in the summertime. Two lit courts at night. It was it was cool. We had about we had about twelve, fifteen guys who would come and play, and pretty good players for a small town. And um, but the the older guys would bug out about seven forty five and go buy go buy the beer yeah. and we'd come back and finish playing and, Those were the and drink days. and yeah, yeah. And so I, all through you know pretty much all through high school um, drank beer I remember going into the Shelton Connecticut was this kind of down in the valley a real um, blue collar um, town I remember going into these dive bars at six nine and never getting <laughs> never getting carded yeah. you know i was 15 16 yeah. years old and just you know drinking beer yeah. and so you know sophomore year rolls around you start to get some attention mm -hmm. then what happens my sophomore year is when things really took off for me um and you know i think my freshman year I averaged 15 16 points a game but that year i averaged 30 and really um, started to get some, you know, certainly statewide attention. Yeah. 
And then, you know, recruiting was different back then that things really didn't intensify until your senior year. And it was then, as you know, as that season unfolded and, and, um, and I saw, you know, the league we were playing in, um, I, you know, I, I, I made the decision that I thought a, a uh, freshman year in college would benefit me more than a senior year in high school. And I had to make that decision then because going into my junior year, there were a couple extra credits that I had to take yeah. to meet, you know, the state requirements. And some of those I had already fulfilled in eighth grade um, with some AP courses. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if my high school coach was real happy about that, although yeah. he's, he's, you know, he's, <laughs> but he's, he's, so been, he's yeah, he's no, and, and he, um, so I kind of narrowed it down to the schools that I was thinking about and decided that summer to go to those on my mm. own and get a feel. And? And um, so I, let's see, I went, to, um, I went to Davidson's basketball camp. I went to Maryland's basketball camp. I went to Davidson's basketball camp. Yeah, which was, Davidson was too small, you know, and Maryland was just too was big. Was McKillop the coach there? Already? Uh, no, a guy named Bo Brickle oh, okay. was, and um, so Maryland was the first school in the uh, first school in the building uh, my freshman year, and they really recruited me hard. Probably they in South Carolina were the two that were most aggressive. Um, and I went to basketball camp down in Maryland. Um, Lefty was driving me around in his Cadillac to my stations <laughs> and stuff, and. Uh, at the time, I was thinking about uh, majoring in journalism, which Maryland has a great journalism school, as does South Carolina and North Carolina, who is in the mix. Um, so he goes, uh, all right, tomorrow you have lunch with me. And uh, I don't know if you m remember the, um, the national columnists, Evans and Novak. They were, mm -hmm. they were nationally syndicated columnists in newspapers all across the country. And um, Bob Novak was a big Maryland fan, big, and so I walk in after morning sessions and 700 kids in the thing, and here, in here he is sitting down, and Lefty introduces mm -hmm. me, and I have this guy who I've seen in my paper, you know, when I pick it up in the morning, um, but that's just, you know, he didn't leave anything, anything to chance. Um, went down to North Carolina, spent a weekend there after, after Davidson's camp, um, then I went down to South Carolina, and uh, matter of fact, I was invited into Bobby Kremen's um, yeah. wedding reception, <laughs> and most of the players were there. So you know, so I met everybody doing that. And uh, interesting recruiting tactic. But, yeah. So when I was at Maryland, um, there was a guy who was a rising senior at Duke named Terry Chili, who saw me play and I was, I was tearing it up at camp, you know, I was playing really well. And, um, so he started talking, chatting Duke up to me and I was like, well, you know, I'm, here's my story. I'm graduating after my junior year. I've only told a few schools that. And he said, well, I think our coaches would really like to talk with you. So that, that's how Duke got into the process. Um, I met the two of their assistant coaches came up, um, Really enjoyed meeting them, Bob Wenzel and Lou Getz. And uh, then I went, uh, I said, all right, I'm, I'm in the process of starting to ar arrange my official visits. You know, let's, uh, let's get something down here. So I put them first because I'd seen all the other places. Uh, these, you know, my official visits to those other schools yeah. were going to be perfunctory. Sure. Um, and I just, I went down to Duke and was just blown away by, you know, by everything. But Coach Foster, who I immediately hit it off with, um, guys on the team, the direction I saw them going in, the school, um, you know, everything just clicked for me. And I, I knew when I got on the plane to go home after that visit, that's where I wanted to go. And I, there were three recruits in that weekend. Uh, a guy named Jim Graziano, who was the yeah, best. Yeah, I remember. He was probably the best high school player in the nation that year, rising senior. And uh, Michael Korn, who was a teammate of yeah. Jimmy Spinarkles at Hudson Catholic, who they thought they were going to get because of that. And I, like I was the fourth best player out of three guys, you know. And uh, and so I got home and I called Coach Foster. I said, I'm, you know. 
I want to come here if you'll, you know, you'll take the chance on me. And they, they didn't wait for Graziano to make a decision. They, they took me then and there. What was your drinking like in college? I pledged and 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 uh, joined a fraternity. I was a SAE at Duke, and um, is the the dorm the uh, the freshman where I lived as a freshman was right near their section. So I got to know all those guys, and um, I, you know, coming coming from the north, growing up in Connecticut, you know, the Greek life is not a big thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not anything in the Ivy Leagues. It's, you know, it's nothing that I grew up with. And, and I said, all right, you know, I'm hanging around with these guys anyway. I might as well join. Yeah. Um, but nothing, you know, keg parties, normal beer drinking yeah, stuff. I mean, you, I mean, you were playing ball so much. I mean, it and it didn't, yeah, and it didn't, you know, you didn't say it. It didn't affect me then. I mean, yeah. I never, yeah, I, yeah. I never was, you know, drunk in class. I never got, you know, yeah. hammered before a game. You know, I was there was never an issue. But, I, but, but I did drink. I didn't drink every day. Yeah. So you're crushing it, Duke. Senior year rolls around. <laughs> NBA talks start. Was it 1980? You 1980. Got yeah, spring of '80. Like seventh pick in the draft. Mm -hmm. With the Nets. That's where my age caught up to me. Yeah. Finally. Because I was I, I I was 16 when I graduated from high school and just turned 17 when I set foot on campus, you know I was 20 when I graduated and just turned 21 and and you you know the league was a lot different back then yeah, yeah. you know there were men playing in the yeah. league and there were only you know only a few rookies came in every year so the league was old yeah. older and they were men and I was still a, a you know a late teen early 20 late bloomer physically and um you know that was that was overwhelming my rookie year yeah all right so 86 87 yes. start playing for the sixers mm -hmm. give me the best barkley story you got that we don't know <laughs> <laughs> oh man um, well, i know there's probably okay. many to choose uh, from all right this was in uh so in in 88 we're, uh, we're we're sitting around in practice, and after practice, and uh, we were icing, and and all of a sudden politics came up, and it was when uh, George Bush, the elder, was running against Mike Dukakis. Yeah. So, Barkley is telling us about the story the day before about how he had his he bought his mom and his grandma they had these adjoining houses down in Leeds, Alabama. He's saying, "Yeah, I said I had a tough phone call last night, and uh, he said I had to tell my my mom, and my grandma, that I was voting for Bush." And we're like, you know, well, what happened? You know, he goes, "Well, you know, I said, you know, grandma, grandma I just, you know, I just wanted to tell you that I'm I'm voting for George Bush for president." And they were like, "Charles, you know that." The, the Democratic Party has helped black Americans, you know, you have to vote Democratic in this, you know, in this election and support Dukakis. And he says, his grandma says, I know I'm black, but I'm rich, too, and I want to keep my money. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Charles. So, yeah. So that was, oh, that was his, his initial yeah. political discussion. But, you know, I remember, too, when I was first down there, um, he and I went to uh, see, remember the movie Mississippi Burning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When that first came out, we went to the theater and watched it. And uh, it was, had a fascinating discussion. Here I'm a white northerner, and yeah. you know, he's a guy, a black guy who grew up in the South. And we were talking about the movie and talking about growing up and life and stuff. And uh, it was, it was, it was a powerful evening. So when you were in the league, were you drinking a lot? Mm -hmm. Were you well, partying? I, like, there I, mean, were, I know back then it was a little bit more <laughs> acceptable in the alcohol and cocaine like, side than it was. Yeah, I mean, I today. remember it yeah. to be more weed, but like you know, again, for it was it was mostly beer. I mean, I did discover and really started to enjoy really good wine. Yeah, probably about my fourth or fifth year in the league, but I can't remember during that time either. You know, drinking a lot of hard liquor either, Patrick. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, was, it was kind of beer, wine, and uh, I mean, I for the average person, you know, they would probably look at me and go, "Yeah, he really drinks." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, but like after you know after a game, um, you know, you, you you're wound up. It's ten thirty at night, and you know, you, you plus you've you lost a ton of weight, so we go out and have like six, seven beers. No big deal. 
and wake up the next morning at, at eight o'clock, have breakfast, go to practice like, you know, like it was nothing. So, you know, you have your time, time with the Sixers kind of prime of your career, come to Charlotte mm-hmm. and your career here, you move into broadcasting for the Hornets for a little bit, then into ACC, you know, tell me about, you know, kind of give me the the quick version of how your drinking progressed because I want to get to kind of what happened and wh- where you kind of decided to remove it from your life. And yeah, I was, um, you know, uh, and the broadcasting on the Hornet side was um, it was illuminating for me. You know, we were traveling with the team, and but. All of a sudden, you've got all this free time. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm not practicing. You know, I'm working out in the in the hotel, or I'm going out walking around the cities that I never visited when I was a player. You mm-hmm. know, I'd go to museums and such. But you know, at night it was meet in the bar, have some cocktails, and this when I really started drinking liquor. Um, you know, was toward the end of my NBA career, and mostly in the summertime, never really during the season, but. Then once the broadcasting started, you know, then it was vodka and cocktails and wine and dinners were, that was, that was the broadcast teams. That's what we did on the road. Yeah. You know, then that turned into being at home and, you know, having cocktails um, later on in the afternoon. I look back at pictures and even through the early 2000s, I, I looked okay people would look at me and say, you're more than a social drinker, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would look back and say, yeah, you know, I completely agree. (laughs) But the cumulative effect, I mean, this is going back to when I was 15, Yeah, you know, so, and we touched on this and like, it never affected me, never affected me, never affected. Well, your body is going through, is starting to have to deal with that stuff then. And, you know, so I get into my, um, I get into my forties and, uh, we, you know, we had Noah when I was 38 in 98 and then things started to probably about two or three years after that collapse, you know, with my home life and my mm-hmm. marriage. And that's when in between 2000 and 2010 things, I had a, I had a spike, um, and things started to escalate for me, yeah. drinking, um, and, and some, and drug use, um, yeah. some cocaine, um, I hated weed. I never liked the high that I got from weed. Um, but, and Coke really, that, that just allowed me to drink more. Yeah. You know, I'd get, we'd be out with friends and I'd like, I was never buying it. I was always other people's yeah, stash, yeah. you know? And, uh, Um, but you know, you'd get, you'd kind of start redlining it a little bit and then you need to bring yourself back some. So I'd, you know, I'd do a little Coke and even myself out and then start drinking again. Um, and that was, you know, that was in the two thousands when, you know, things were really sideways with my marriage. I've got a son who's growing up in that. And, um, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a dark time. Yeah. Dark time for me too going through it right at the same time pretty much <laughs> right down the street from each other yeah no and you know and it's it's funny how and things in my life have come full circle and uh in a in a positive way and, yeah. and in ways that i never even thought you know would happen but yeah. um yeah and you know and and through you know through all that um you know, I was hanging out at different restaurants at night, and uh, that's where I met, um, you know, the woman that I fell in love with. I was still married at the time, Sarah Culpepper. And, um, you know, we went we went through a bunch, but it was the first, it was the first time I was happy in a long time. Um, and really didn't, you know, drinking really kind of, I mean, we, we still, we, you know, she loved good wine as mm-hmm. well, and we still drank, but not nearly where I was, you know, leading up to her, you know, meeting her. Um, and so I went through another real rough stretch where, you know, I was tried to reconcile my marriage, um, broke things off with Sarah. The marriage didn't, you know, that didn't work. Went back to her, and you know she took me back. I moved out of the house in 2011, 
and I was divorced in 2012, and we were engaged in 2013. So I really thought, you know, my son took a, a hit from that, obviously, and um, but where I moved was literally a half mile away from where our house was. And so he was, he was riding his bike back yeah. and forth. And I'm not saying that it took no toll on him, but I was around him a lot during that stretch. And, um, you know, I thought, all right, kind of made it through, you know, 10, 11, 12 years of really rough, choppy water. And things are going to even out a little bit now. So 2015... With Sarah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, she was 23 years younger than me. And I remember I would ask her periodically, are you sure, you know, about this? You know, I'm, you know, I was like five years younger than her dad. And, um, you know, she said, yeah, you know, I, I, she's always been attracted to older men. And she goes, it's not a problem with me. And I was always worried about, you know, I, from, you know, from 32 to 55 is, you know, that's, that's man, that's a manageable gap, mm -hmm. but you know, from 57 to 80, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking down the road here. And, uh, I was always worried about leaving her still with a lot of her life left to lead, yeah. you know? And, uh, and then she started having some liver issues, um, probably in 2014, which were the effect of um, drinking. You know, she was abused as a child by a neighbor um, and went through a lot of trauma in her own right and had trouble sleeping um, and was taking these she was the type of personality, you know, it said, if it said take two Tylenol PM to go to sleep, she'd take four mm -hmm. or more, you know, and, you know, come to find out about Tylenol that, you know, it, what it does to your system and that combined with the drinking. And she was not a, she was not a big lady, you know, she was petite. Um, and it just, it really started to affect her liver. And we went through an initial, process of dealing with that and thought we had gotten ahead of it. Um, but uh, it turns out we, <laughs> we didn't. Um, we went down to, I uh, went down to Atlanta on a road trip. She came with me at a game down at Georgia Tech. A good friend stayed down there. We, we went down, had an awesome weekend, um, came back, and then I had a game in Pittsburgh the following weekend. So I got to pit and was calling and had, you know, I had trouble getting a hold of her and finally, you know, texted and talked and she said, yeah, I just haven't been feeling well. Um, you know, just looking forward to you getting home. And I was, I came back on, uh, it was, you know, I was looking back forward cause it was uh, Valentine's day. It was the 14th. So I get back and she's not in great shape. And I, you know, I, I asked her, I said, you know, do we need to go to the ER, you know, or, and she goes, no, no, I just need to go to sleep. And uh, so I got her settled in. Um, I went to the store to pick up some things, came back, um, didn't hear anything from the room. So I thought she was sleeping. I didn't want to disturb her. And about 45 minutes later, I walk in and she is unresponsive with blood coming out of her mouth. And I just, you know... I, I, I call 911. Um, the woman there is talking me through. I, she said, you need to get her on a hard surface to uh, do heart compression until the EMTs get there. So I got her down on the floor, carried her down, let her down, and got over and started. First heart massage, blood came flying out of her mouth. And, you know, so I'm... I, I'm, I, I can't say that I'm even freaking out that I'm just, I don't even know where I am at that yeah. point. And the, and the, the EMTs got there very quickly. Um, and, but the police came. And so the EMTs are working on her in our bedroom and I'm, the police are questioning me yeah. in the other room to make sure that this wasn't, you know, I didn't beat sure. the, 
you yeah. know, hell out of her. And, you know, they want to know my story for the whole evening. And, and you know, as I found out that her, she, she went into cardiac arrest twice at the apartment for three or so minutes plus. And they got her back and then they went to the hospital. They went to Presbyterian about four in the morning, three in the morning at that point. And the police finally let me go. You know, they, they were getting walkie talkie with the, with the ambulance. And they said they got her to the, you know, to the hospital and then they said she's stabilized. And I said, what does that mean? You know, and didn't know that they had, you know, tubed her and that she was basically on life support. She had, she went into cardiac, she went into cardiac arrest a couple more times at the ER. And uh, so spent the night there outside the ICU and with her and her, called her family. Her family all came in and, uh, you know, we, the doctor said, you know, we can't tell you what to do, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, she's, she's, she's gone. You know, this is her life. And, you know, I, I had to make the decision to take her off of, you know, off of life support. And that was on the 15th, um, about noon. And, you know, every, the whole world changed for me. Um, just the trauma of that was, um, you know, I, I, I still live with it, yeah. you know, to this day. And, um, you know, and, and <laughs> rather than rather than do the smart thing and seek some sort of counseling, you know, some sort of professional help on the front end than going into grief counseling or seeing some sort of spiritual counseling, you know, I decided to self-medicate I had such amazing people in my life um that they gave me about a two-year hall pass on my drinking and I literally I mean for for close to two years I mean I cried myself to sleep every single night and I you know I, I just would start drinking and get more and more depressed and that's how the evening went and I cried myself until there were no more tears, and I went to sleep. I was supposed to do a Duke Carolina game the Wednesday after she had passed away, and but we were having her um, memorial service on that Thursday, and I, you know, I've been in t I was in touch with my TV guys, and I'm like, you know, so Dan Bonner and I used to we'd switch off during the Duke Carolina game. And, uh, and he came and filled in for me that Wednesday and all of the TV people came to, mm -hmm. you know, the, her memorial service. And I, <laughs> you know, nobody in the family could speak. And actually one, one was one of her cousins did, but I, and I was left to me to give her eulogy. And that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, to, when I walked up and stood and looked out and all those faces, it, like thousands of different stories hit me, you know, my relationship to all those people at one time. And um, that next weekend was at, uh, was at Carolina, Georgia Tech at Carolina. And, you know, I told my guys, I said, I need, I need, I can't, you know, just yeah, not sit, work. sit in that yeah. apartment. I need to. So I, I knew that that was going to be an emotional time because that was my first time back with my Raycom crew and, and all that. So I, I walked up to, um, I went to the Smith Center. It was a noon game. And uh, a guy named Steve Kirshner, who was their media relations guy for basketball, I, I walked in the Smith Center. He was the only one there. And we saw each other, and he came over, and we hugged and cried, and, you know, and he, and he – he gave me an envelope, and I said, "Kirsch, you know, you've already, you know, we've talked and everything." He says, "No, no, no, this is for you." And um, it's it was a, a a condolence card signed by every member of the Carolina team and every coach, and not just signatures. You know, sorry for your loss. Yeah. You know, grieving, make you know, rest in peace, Sarah. And, Very cool. You know, 
I met with all my Raycom people, and then you know we go up and meet with the coaches before um, before every game. And I walked into Roy's office, and he just saw me and started to cry. And we never even talked about the game. And I probably spent a half an hour up there with him, just talking about, you know, he wanted to know where I, how where mm-hmm. I was. Yeah. Um, and that, that's and I and I tell that, and then as you know, that's the the Duke Carolina thing that people don't see, you yeah. know, and that's what I love about it the most. Yeah. Um, because we're we're there for each other. I mean, we want to destroy each other between the lines, but outside of that, you know, there's there's a lot of love. And what allowed me to do what I did for 14 years in the NBA had this undying belief in myself, which really started with the punt, pass, and kick thing at 11. Yeah. That I'm gonna deal with this myself. Um. And that's where my my ego got in the way of treatment of a lot of things. Um, and it after about two years, I was up at a, a Duke function, and my team there was like, this isn't going in a good direction. Yeah. <laughs> and they tried to have an intervention for me. I was not having it. Yeah. Um, they and Kenny Denard, they I, and I found this out afterwards. They had talked to the NBA. They had all this oh, stuff so arranged. Yep. There was a teammate, Jim Suddeth, who was going to come and drive me to Truly. All this stuff was all arranged, and Kenny was the one who, and he, but he did it over the phone. It wasn't in person. And um, I remember I was driving up to uh, Noah was at up at Christ school, my yeah, son yeah. playing football and I was going up to a game and I got the phone call and, and I MF'd him. I, I swore at Kenny up and down. I says, you know, you have no right, blah, 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 blah. you know, I, I had the typical negative reaction uh, yeah, sure. to intervention. <laughs> so I, and I pull in to this gas station right before you go back to Christ school and I finish up the conversation and, uh, so if you go right, you go to Christ School, about 300 yards down the left-hand side, there's an ABC store, I swear to God. And I was like, all right, you think I got a problem? I'm gonna, I went down and bought a fifth. Actually, I probably bought a handle of vodka and went to the football game, was drinking, mm-hmm. drank all the way on the drive home. Um, and then at that point, I cut everybody off. And I was like, all right, I don't want to hear any more talk any more intervention i'm gonna isolate and you know starting in 217 218 that's when things really started to go sideways so you're at home drinking yourself to death Mm -hmm. what was the turning point the best thing that ever happened to me was covid um I was I was living at home. I barely got through the 2000, <clears throat> um, 19, 20 season. Well, I remember I, I got my last game was in March, and we had you know we had isolation in place. Um, so I was like, all right, perfect storm. Yeah, this is awesome. I mean, all I have to do is sit in here and and drink, and that's it. Yeah. Um, and got through that year somehow. Um, and after the season, I said, I, I said to myself, I said, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to broadcast, you know, I won't be able to broadcast next year if we have a season. So <laughs> I started negotiating with myself. Yeah. You know, I said, all right, um, I'm going to go through March madness and drink, and then I'm going to get some, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to address this. And then, you know, April came <laughs> and it like played that game. Well, eh, maybe I'll, uh, you know, and, and so, and, and my son is with me during this, he's living with me in this apartment during this whole thing. He's right on the front line, you know, and he's seeing what I'm doing to myself. And, um, so it's probably in, June of that year, maybe late May, early June, 
that I was I was going to be you know the the recycling bin is really filling up quickly at this point, and so the apartment we lived in we had woods out in the back, so I was taking every other bottle and throwing them out back, you know thinking I'm going to be real slick about this mm-hmm. and and so and and Noah was out walking one day and he saw. You know, of course, I didn't spread them out over, you know, mm-hmm. a couple hundred yards. I was throwing them in the same place. Yeah. So he finds the bottles. And um, so I I have my every other day or every third day trip to the ABC store. And, you know, back then you have to stand outside and put your yeah. order in and go through all that. And it was a process. But I came back from the ABC store at Cotswold. And um, there's a table like this in our dining room um, with a whole bunch of dirty, filthy vodka bottles on it. And a note from from Noah that said, Dad, I love you, I wanna help you. And I just, you know. Can't say no to that. Yeah, and and shame. I mean, you know, that hits you. I mean, it just brought to my knees. And, you know, we had I was still drinking. We had some, you know, some a lot of serious, tearful conversations, and um, and then July 10th, I'm sitting at my normal. I've got my seat. Your drinking station. My drinking station. I've got my, <laughs> I got my bottle. I got my water and my yeah. vodka, and uh, you know, I'm very. I'm, I keep hydrated during mm-hmm. this. You know, yeah, I'm very, yeah, I'm very efficient. And um, so Noah comes walking out with a computer. It's on, and I know, you know, I know what, what's happened. But you know, the difference is, Patrick, that I'm like begging for this to happen at this point. I'm not strong enough to do it myself. I'm not strong enough to pick up the phone and say, "Come get me." You know, I, I look back on it as it's it's me being coached and being told what to do basically my whole life. Mm-hmm that I needed that. And, you know, within, within 10 minutes of that, I'm like, you know, I was talking to these two guys down at rebound who were doing the intervention via zoom. And the woman who was our maid of honor in our wedding had 12 or 13 years at that point sober, you know, she had been through all this. So I didn't know that Noah, um, they were all orchestrated. Yeah. yeah. This was going on for a month or so before Mm -hmm. I ever even happened. I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear the message, and it was him. It was the right voice, and I, you know, I was just, I was ready. Um, and thank God for him that he could have, you know, he he stuck by me through the worst of the worst. And it was funny that uh, Chris Penn, who I was, he would, I worked with him when I went down in treatment, said he saw. Noah's expression when I said, you know, because he was, he was like, what do I do if he gets up? And what if I do if he yeah. gets mad or walks out the door? You know, what am I? And as soon as I said, what's, you know, when can I come? He was like, you know, he, yeah, it's like <sighs> the weight of the world was, yeah. you know, was taken off his shoulders. And I was, I left, uh, the intervention was on the 10th of July and so they told me, he says, you need to keep drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because I'm the, the seizure risk. I got Xanax and, and uh, Prozac and all this stuff in me. And so I'm, you know, my, my ex-wife, um, Stacy and Noah drove me down to treatment. I'm in the back of the car drinking vodka on the way down mm-hmm. to, to treatment. And I, I, come, I came in hot down, yeah. <laughs> down in Florida. Um, and that yeah. was that was the start of it. Oh, man. No, it was courage to be able to intervene on you like that and set all that up. I mean, I love that story and you know what it's done and where you are now. It's incredible. <clears throat> He's an old soul anyway, yeah. and I know we we made him grow up quick with you know with what he went through, and and it's not you know a lot of unfortunately a lot of kids and you know grow yeah. up with divorce and you know have to deal with a lot of stuff and uh um but you know for him to you know and and the thing patrick even from 
from a very early age that we always had a great line of communication. And I, I, I think there were things that I learned from my, my growing up. And it was hard for him to grow up in the state of North Carolina with my last name. Yeah. There was a lot of pressure on him. Yeah. And we had to navigate through a lot of stuff. Um, and we did because we always could talk to one another. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably why he was able to do that, too. You know, fast forward, when I came back <clears throat> after two and a half months, uh, he stayed with me yeah. you know, just to make sure, you know, he wanted. And, and I'll never forget that hug when he saw me when he came down to pick me up um, when, I was, when I was finished down in Florida. So how long has it been now since you've had a drink? Well, my last drink was July 13th, 2020. So that was yeah, the, that was the vodka. Four years. Yeah, and I remember just being in such a state of calm and peace that f even that first day down in uh, yeah. immersions, it was over. Then it was over. Yeah. I was being medicated. I had. I was. I was. <laughs> I was being. No, oh, you know, it wasn't like I was yeah. white knuckling this thing. Yeah, you got it, the help that you needed. Yeah, it was. It was uh -huh. clinical. It was. It was funny. I, so I, I go in there for the, the first night. They get me into my room, and um, there's a, a woman who's who's there, sitting there watching me, or sitting just sitting there in the room with me. So it's going to be about 9.30, 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you know, ma'am, I think I'm doing pretty well. You can go if you know if you, if you want. She goes, oh, no, 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 I, I stay here. And she... They had somebody in the room with me 24 hours a day yeah. for the first five or six days that I was yeah. down there. Um, and they're coming in and checking my vitals every four hours. You know, I got to the point where I didn't even wake up for it at night. You know, yeah, they yeah. just come in and do my, do my thing. But I, I did an initial seven-day taper. Um, <clears throat> that didn't go <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as planned, yeah. so I had to do an extra four days. And that got me to the point where they could release me to uh, rebound. Yeah. yeah. So you stayed down there a couple months, <clears throat> came back to Charlotte. <clears throat> and how, how how are you doing now? Like, what do you, <clears throat> in terms of? Well, I I know, but for the mm -hmm. you know, for the listeners, like, what what is your you know what keeps you sane? What fills your cup? When I came back. Um, you know, I was I was originally going to go down there for a month, and talking about coming full circle, Jason Williams, yeah. uh, it's his place, and I had him as a rookie with the Sixers mm -hmm. <laughs> teams, and he was. We got to get him on, man. His story's yeah. pretty wild too. Yeah, and so it was kind of in this full circle thing of coming to you know me trying to, you know, his dad telling him midway through his rookie year, he says, "Why don't you hang around with G Man more than Charles?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he wasn't have he wasn't hearing it, but you know, for me to go and 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 find sobriety, you know, in a place that he started, um, was really pretty pretty cool, pretty cool and pretty amazing. Um, uh, like all the you know, like providential God was guiding me through all this. Um, and so I I came back and I was down there from July until the end of September. And then I came back and did an outpatient yeah. via Zoom here in Charlotte for six months. And I, I went, the, the basketball season started that next year. Yeah. And I went through a full year of broadcasting, my first year and sober. And I didn't even, I even gotten to a year yet. Yeah. Um, and everybody was so incredibly supportive of me um, and you know, got, and I, I, you know, I, I was on a good trajectory. It was early, but I felt good enough to, you know, that, that I needed again to go back to work and get into this rhythm again, you know, and, and for the, for the people there, my, my Christianity has been a huge part of my recovery. And, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this recently too, that, um, when going going to church service was part of our 
group down in Florida yep. on Sundays. And I really, it took me a year to get my head cleared out. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think yeah. if, if I'd got, if I had thrown myself into my faith immediately, I don't know that it would have had the same effect. Yeah. Um, I started to get introduced to it. And then it was probably a year and a half into sobriety that I really started to embrace Christ and em- embrace, you know, the Bible and my study and, you know, and, and that spiritual side of me. Um, and for two years, I went back down to Rebound and worked there as a, a peer mentor. Uh, I was, you know, I was somebody who had been through the program and was... I was the mediator. I was kind of in between the, you know, the therapists that we had running the groups and the and the people who were new into the program. And yeah. I was, you know, a lot of times I'd get the conversation going. I'd get, I'd, I'd Give lay myself hope. open and, yeah. you know, get them to talk about things and, you know, to feel comfortable about that. And then, um, you know, t- this uh, twenty twenty three. I got through the broadcast season and I said, you know, I, I really would like to come back here to North Carolina and this is what I see myself doing. Um, I want to help, but I want to reach more people. Yeah. You know, I was that, that experience as a mentor down a rebound was really incredibly important to me and my growth and my sobriety yeah. during that time. But it was, I was only touching two or three people at a time, you know, and I thought that you know, maybe there's, you know, I can broaden my horizons back here a little bit more. And, and then we met. And then we met. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> cool. um, and, and, and for me, um, you know, one, one thing Christ talks about is to be, be thankful in every circumstance. And, you know, I can look back and see every, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for, you know, I look back at the, the life that I've had, the, you know, playing in the NBA, playing at Duke, <laughs> stepping right into broadcasting. You know, I've never written a resume in my life. I've never had a break in, in, in this. I just finished my 30th year broadcasting. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's just it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's a dream. I mean, it's something that I worked extraordinarily hard for, you know, along the way, but still, I mean, you know, to look at that life and, you know, there are no complaints, but now to use a really dark time in my life as something, uh, uh, you know, a new working with you and, and working in this, in the recovery field, uh, at my age, to find something that you're passionate and feel something like that for that's brand new to you is, is such a gift. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have so much respect for guys, you know, that are in situations like you that have, you know, kind of lived, lived a, a really incredible life and then decide at a later age to, to you know, give up alcohol and 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 really live the last, mm-hmm. you know, last bit of their life with a, <clears throat> you know, a vigor to serve and 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 I've seen you know, it was funny that I I just I need I was on this horrible track to an early death with my drinking, yeah. and I just needed because everything really all the discipline and, and focus and everything that made me a great athlete made me a, a drunk, yeah. you know, I did. And I just, I needed to get over here mm-hmm. and, and I got into treatment and I got sober. And now all those things that are inside me are working toward my sobriety yeah. and my faith. And I just need, I just had to get off, yeah. you know, get over into this other track. And, uh, um, you know, so, so that, um, and, and just the, you know, the, the small exposure that I've had to it 
um, you know, with you and through church and having people come up to me and tell me that, you know, my story has touched them or touched the family member or have people come to me to coach them through some things. Yeah. Um, you know, the purpose that God is using me, f- you know, using me for now, um, more than, you know, this is now who I am. You know, that's the, the other stuff is what I did and that's what people know me for. Um, and look, it's, it's given me a great platform. You know, it's, it's really given me a voice yeah. to do what I'm doing, but this is now who I am. Well, man, this is uh, exactly what I, you know, envisioned this uh, conversation to be like, man. And um, I just, I, I'm so glad to uh, call you a brother and a friend. And it's, uh, we got a lot of good stuff ahead of us. And uh, thanks for sharing your recovery with, um, with everybody. Yeah, no, and that's, you know, to me, it's funny, I, I, and <laughs> They were doing a uh, HBO Real Sports with Brian yeah. Gumbel was doing a, a feature on Jason and what he's doing down at Rebound. And they had found out that I was just newly through that program. And so the producer said, you know, do you think Mike would? So I talked with them and, and he, he goes, would you mind, you know, would you come on the record? And I was like, yeah. You know, because a woman named Mary Carrillo was the reporter doing yeah. the feature, and I've known Mary for years. I, you know, I used to go to the U.S. Open tennis up in New York all the time, and I trusted her. I felt good about sitting down, and that was the first time. That was in March of twenty twenty one. That um, it hadn't even been a year in in sobriety yet, yeah. and. Here I am telling HBO <laughs> what I, yeah. what I just went through. But it was it was really empowering for me to to be able to do that and and that that experience got me extremely comfortable with being completely honest about Yeah. And it keeps you accountable too. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Like- yeah. And you know, I know that I'm I'm like this human I'm not trying to inflate my own importance by any means but I'm like this human billboard that's out yeah. there walking around people yeah. know my story they know me they're looking at me yeah. you know how is how is he living his life how is he conducting yeah. himself <laughs> and that's great I mean I and I and I yeah. embrace that and some and that's you know again it goes back it's been kind of my whole life has been that in another yeah fashion i love it when we're out in public and people come up and say hey man you look like mike jaminski yeah yeah, yeah. well <laughs> I, yeah i do favor him a little bit you know <laughs> uh, but um and um but when you when you touch somebody's life that's you know well, very popular it's very very powerful well thanks for doing this today man i love you yeah i love you too man yeah. this is um, been good talk about coming full circle with uh you know i was i was your uncle Bob's best wine customer for a long time. And yeah. all the people I knew in Charlotte well, now were Now we're trying drinking. to put his ass out of business. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, so, um, but, uh, and, and, you know, and like you said, you, you knew of me, mm-hmm. you saw me play and, uh, you know, I didn't know you growing up. Um, and we actually had a, a mutual friend, Allison Dellinger, yeah. Yeah. who said, you guys should have lunch. Mm-hmm. And we did. Yep. Very grateful for that. All right, man. Well, that's a wrap. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll do it again. Yeah. No, yeah. Be-